Welcome to the Township of Whitewater Region Regular Council Meeting for Wednesday, December 1, 2021 at 4.47 p.m. As we gather, we would like to acknowledge on behalf of our Council and our community that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We would like to thank the Algonquin people and express our respect and support for their rich history, and we are extremely grateful for their many and continued displays of friendship. We also thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Please stand for the prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks for the great blessings which have been bestowed on Canada and its citizens, including the gifts of freedom, opportunity, and the peace that we enjoy. Guide us in our deliberations as Council and strengthen us in our awareness of our duties and responsibilities. Grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to preserve the blessings of this country and the benefit of all and to take good laws and great decisions. Amen. So at this time, I would ask if there's any disclosure of interest for this evening's proceedings. Seeing none, we'll move on and we go to item four, 4.1, public meeting. So, Mr. Sampson, if you're on. Uh, I'm here, can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear us? I can hear you, yes I can. And we can hear you. So you're on, go ahead, you have 10 minutes. Okay, I appreciate this. Um, okay, my name is Ben Sampson. I am here today to voice my concerns over the unprecedented violations of our constitutional charter of rights and freedoms, which is the supreme law of our land and all other laws must be consistent with the rules set out in it. Before I begin, I ask that you consider Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Six months ago, my little boy and I were so excited to start his hockey experience and purchased all of his equipment, which he tried on multiple times. I paid his fees and we began the season. He was so proud and kept telling me how good he was to my glee as I was the proud one. After a few ice times, I was locked out for, from watching and a kind lady in Cobden helped me get him on the ice. This did not sit well with my wife as she has witnessed her sister almost kidnapped when she was younger. She argued that a pedophile has easier access to our child than us and that it only takes a second and that there is no going back. I agreed and we decided to stop going. I cannot put a price on the value of watching my five-year-old in his first season of hockey and to have him watch him fall behind his peers so vaccinated ad adults can feel safe. Citizens are being segregated, persecuted, discriminated against, and turned against one another. It has been just over two months since the vaccine passports arrived in Ontario, and not only have cases risen, but we now have hospitals understaffed unqualified teachers in classrooms, great workers unemployed, kids unable to play sports, and a divided society. Why? Well, because of science. I understand that you have all received my notice of liability, as, we met, as was mentioned in my email conversation with Carmen Miller, your municipal clerk. They were drawn up by Canada's top human rights lawyer, Rocco Galati, and will hold up in a court of law should our rights and freedoms ever be granted back to us. The fines that come along with these can be up to 35,000 per notice per person violating enshrined law and possible criminal convictions for multiple violations, including persecution as laid out in the Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act, which can carry a life sentence. These are not personal and I would rather not pursue them, but they are my only course of action at the moment. I would like to point out that by requiring proof of vaccination in order to avail of goods, services, accommodations, employment, and any other opportunity is extortion, as described in the Canadian Criminal Code, Section 346.1. In Canada, vaccination cannot be made mandatory, as stated in the Canadian National Report on Immunization, 1996, page 3, because of our Canadian Constitution. There is no emergency that can supersede our charter rights, our constitution, which states in section two, everyone has the following fundamental freedoms. A, freedom of conscience and religion. Everyone 
conscious, sorry, conscious is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the part of your mind that tells you whether your actions are right or wrong to have a clear conscience. Meaning one has the right to decline something without being discriminated against for their decisions or views. As for religion, I will not give the definition as all are familiar with this, but I will mention that I personally have strong convictions regarding my faith and who owns my body. Therefore, if I were permitted, I would claim a re religious exemption as well as a conscious one. In section seven of our charter, it states, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof. Liberty is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the state of being free, free within a society from oppressive restrictions on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. Last I checked, hockey in Canada was a way of life, and depriving citizens public access for services that they pay for is an infringement of, on one's liberty and an attack on our freedoms we used to enjoy as free Canadians. I understand at the moment our laws seem to have been discarded, and most don't grasp the seriousness of the situation we are facing because of this. But I ask that we can have an open dialogue and to be heard. In Ontario... The government is currently operating under the Reopening Ontario Act, which it states in Section 2 that it is a continuation of 7.0.2 of the Emergency Management and Civil Protections Act. Emergency Management and Civil Protections Act 7.021 states, the purpose of making orders under this section is to promote the public good by protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the people of Ontario, which at this point is debatable. In times of declared emergencies, Emergency was removed in June 2021 in a manner that is subject to our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It also states in 7.0.2, Section 3, orders made under this section are subject to the following limitations. One, the actions authorized an order shall be exercised in a manner which, consistent with the objectives, limits their intrusiveness. Having to show medical records breaking laws set out in FIPA, our Personal Health Information Protection Act, seems intrusive and carries a personal fine of up to $200,000 and possible one year in prison for individuals. And for an entity such as a corporation or a municipality, it carries a $1 million fine. An order shall only apply to, so section number two of that same section is, an order shall only apply to areas of the province where it is necessary. Only areas of the province that it's necessary. 11 deaths to date in Renfrew County to over two years span. I don't think that's necessary. Number three, sec subject to section 7.08, an order shall be effective only for as long as is necessary. Since emergency revoked, it is no longer necessary. And if you read 7.0.8, it says an order in is revoked 14 days after it is made, unless revoked sooner. I did not make up these laws. They are public for all to see. I advise everyone to familiarize themselves with our laws, our God-given rights, and our liberties, which were written in blood by our ancestors, or risk the chance of losing them forever. I found this profound quote from Ronald Reagan. Freedom is a fragile thing and is never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by inheritance, it must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation, for it comes only once to a people. Those who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. I would like to point out that so far COVID, as per the official narrative, has taken the lives of over 5 million people worldwide, and I don't mean to diminish them, but in the last two years, and during, that's in the last two years, and during that same span, of the two years, 18 million people, mainly children, have perished due to starvation without a thought from most. The world raced headfirst into a frenzy and settled on forcing citizens to be part of an experimental gene therapy that required the definition of vaccines to be updated to have it play the part. Regardless of one's views or opinions, the fact remains that COVID vaccines are only approved for emergency use by Health Canada and have not met the rigorous clinical studies required for full approval. It is my opinion that they will never be approved as this would mean possible liability for big pharma. 
the fact that we they have zero liability and government is forcing people to take the, this injection or be restricted from participating in society and forcing those who comply to show their papers sh should tell you all you need to know. The World Health Organization is now admitting that they don't stop spread or prevent someone from getting COVID, only lessen hospitalization and death, which is really immeasurable. In a properly functioning society, we would have leaders questioning to push to get everyone jabbed, especially our children with an experiment. Since when have global corporate executives been trusted to prioritize true public health over literally trillions in profits, especially when we consider these same companies have begun convicted and fined of the, for the largest criminal and civil false claims violations that have ever been committed by a corporation. Let me ask a few simple questions. No need to answer, but please be honest with yourselves. Who in this room knows somebody who has been adversely affected by one of these vaccines? I personally know many. Why the passports for a vaccine that does not stop transmission and technically should be protecting those that took it from those that haven't? When has vaccines of efficacy been dependent on those who haven't received it? Maybe there is something more nefarious at hand. Maybe we should be asking more questions of those who are demanding these unjust mandates. Maybe we should uphold our laws and statutes that haven't failed us so far in the past, instead of giving up our freedoms for safety. Just maybe. If we do not have freedom to choose what is best for our own bodies, then what freedoms do we really have left? I know what you were thinking, something on the lines of don't be selfish or it's your duty. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's selfish to require me to go against my conscience and interpretation of my own creator's laws. It's selfish to remove my rights and freedoms because I don't consent to take part in an experiment. This is exactly why the Nuremberg Code came out of World War II. I would advise you all to take the time to read its 10 basic principles. The United Nations Declaration on bioethics and human rights, of which Canada is, is a signatory, states the individual the rights, the interests of the individual should have priority over the sole interest of science and society. Why would the interests of individual body autonomy and medical privacy take precedence over the interests of society? For the simple reason that every crime committed against humanity in history had a genesis in the belief that the temporary suspension of fundamental human rights was nece necessary for the greater good. History is on a path to repeat its mistakes of the past, and those who per are perse persecuted suffer the most, but those who go along to get along end up in despair. I am not sure how we can go back to normal, as many damages have been done to me and the people of Canada. Excess morality is, on the r is rising and not from COVID. Children are being indoctrinated to believe they are sick, can kill their loved ones, and developing anxiety and phobias. Suicide rates are rising, drug overdoses are rising, society as a whole is losing its compassion for one another okay, all over a virus Sanson, with a 99.98% recovery rate. I am almost done. One more minute, please. In closing, no, I would sorry, like your to time point out, in closing, I would like to point out that what's being implemented in our community is unlawful, immoral, and a disgrace to everything our country has stood for. If policies continue to be implemented, I and many others in the community and country will pursue accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. Now we go on to 4.2, zoning growth readiness presentation. Did you, are you to that? Did you Yes. Uh, 4.2, does this go to Lane? Who does this go to? Well, I, I can introduce the, the, uh, the okay. guests that we have, if you will, uh, Mr. Mayor, if that's all yes, right with please. you. Yeah. So we have with us uh, today, Kent Randall. Kent is, um, a principal planner with EcoView Consulting Services. Uh, he's been with them since 2009, and he's a, a professional. Uh, he's a full member of the Ontario Professional Planners Institute. He's a registered professional planner. Uh, also in support uh, to Kent is Adrian Harrop. So uh, Adrian is the principal consultant with Strexer Harrop Incorporates. Uh, she's been practicing economic development uh, for uh, since 2003. So. Uh, EcoView Consulting, in, <clears throat> with the support of Strexer Harrop, are conducting the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw update, the growth readiness strategies, and the development standards. So I'll just hand it over to Kent if you just want to uh, go ahead and present uh, the, the information you have tonight. Thanks. 
Thanks, Ivan. And uh, hello, everybody. And nice to meet uh, Council and, and, and everybody else. Uh, as, uh, as Ivan said, my name is Kent Randall with EcoView Consulting. Um, so I have a presentation. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if staff are going to share that or if I can share my screen. You should be able to share your screen. Can you try? Okay. I, yeah, I will do that. It's no problem. Okay. There we, we go. Can we see can the, up, there, up there on the monitor. Yes, yep, we can you. see it. Yep, it's good. Thanks. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, we're we're very excited to be to be a part of this uh, this project or these projects as I'll get into. Um, I, I know the council is aware of uh, is aware of what's what's be, uh, we're planning uh, and land use consulting firm at Peterborough. Uh, we've been around since two thousand six. Um, I'm the principal there. We have a, a fairly broad staff of, of seven planners and uh, several other technicians. Um, uh, included in this uh, in this project with the project team is SHCG at a bridge north, which is just near Peterborough. Uh, Adrian Harrop, as, as Ivan uh, introduced, is with me, and she's the principal of that, uh, that firm. And they're working primarily on the growth readiness um, component of the, of the project. Um, I've also included here as a, as a list some other uh, uh, um, folks from EcoView that are assisting with the project. I'm sort of the project manager and overview, uh, provide the overview of the project, uh, uh, while the the uh, the other um, the other employees of EcoView will provide support for uh, for those for those projects. Andrew Marshall, Jess Reed, Milo Cullen, uh, among them. Um, our specialty is in, uh, we, we do a lot of projects of just across central and eastern Ontario, northern Ontario, um, GTA. So we're all over the place, um, but we do have a, a, a fairly good expertise um, and, and fairly good experience with, with small to mid-sized municipalities and rural municipalities. We've done a lot of rural work, agricultural work. Um, so we understand uh, sort of the, the, the issues and, and uh Factors that go into to planning in in uh, in smaller municipalities uh, in in those rural areas to, uh, uh, throughout the province. So, what are these projects exactly? So, uh, as I said, I'm I, I'm sure that I was provided uh, provided an overview to council at some point. Um, but just to briefly go over them, we have a, the growth readiness action plan, and these are all kind of being done in tandem. Um, the Growth Readiness Action Plan, Development Standards, um, and the Comprehensive uh, Zoning Bylaw Updates. So, uh, you know, briefly, the Growth Readiness is um, is a plan or strategy to 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 the response to the increased growth pressures that that uh, that are coming to Whitewater Region or they're anticipated to come, um, but also to provide some some. Uh, uh, guidance for for how the municipality wants to grow into the future and where they want where you want to see growth occur. Um, we're also going to be working on development standards, uh, so creating a set of standards for the municipality for for so that developers, prospective um, applicants for you know building permits, things like that, can uh, follow a standard set of guidelines and they understand what they need what their what the municipality would be looking for. Um, and then the big one is the comprehensive zoning bylaw update, and of course that's take, taking all four of the uh, existing uh, former municipal um, zoning bylaws and putting them together into one standardized uh, zoning bylaw. So, um, just briefly, each each one um, growth readiness. As I said, it's really a, a matter of of uh, responding to to growth pressures, but also to um, determining what the municipality wants to see out of its growth. So where do you want growth to occur? Um, you know, for instance, is there, is there a certain type of uh, industrial growth that is conducive to the, to the township? Is there a certain type of tourist uh, to tourism or, or, or uh, um, waterfront uh, development that, that the municipality may want to see or sort of provide the tools for uh, to, to guide that sort of growth uh, within the municipality? That's really the purpose of this, this action plan is to provide those goals and measurable objectives uh, to the municipality. So this is the component that Adrian is working on. Adrian and her team are, are working on closely. Um, it involves reaching out to stakeholders, uh, conducting surveys and, and determining what it is that, that the, that the uh, primary uh, 
people that, that, that are involved with with uh, with growth in the, in the uh, township, what they want to see out of the municipality. Of course, it's also what council uh, and the people want to see as well. Um, we're expected that will be the first component that will be finished, and we're expecting to finish that in January and February of, of 2022. Here's a brief flow chart of, of uh, where we started and, and where we're going. Um, I see there it says data analysis and, it should say and review. <laughs> Um, and so uh, right now we're still sort of in that fact-finding phase, and we hope to have a, a draft plan uh, at some point in January, uh, and then moving towards a, a final plan uh, the next month. Uh, the next component is the development standards. Uh, as I said, it's, it's providing sort of a guideline uh, or set of guidelines or standards for uh, pers prospective development. Um, so... Things like guideline, guidance for site site plans, um, and uh, you know, for instance, a plan of subdivision. Uh, you know, having a standard for for how a road should be built, um, landscaping, providing just general standards for landscaping and with landscaping plans and things like that. It it it, it creates a, um, uh, a set of guidelines for those applicants or prospective builders or developers so that there's, there's a standardization across the board and that people understand what they need to do and what's expected of them um, from staff and from the municipality. And it, it goes as far as to, to, to provide some standards for even you know, building permits and things like that. Um, the, the, you know, the full uh, breadth of, of what it's going to look like, like is to be determined, but these are sort of the things that we are looking at in terms of uh, in terms of what those standards will look like. Um, this is also going to involve a, a consultation with stakeholders. It's our hope that we have a draft document that we can present to those stakeholders. Um, you know, stakeholders being people uh, people like developers, um, consultants, uh, business owners. You know, people who have who have gone through that the, the process, perhaps of site plan approval or, or other uh, similar processes. Uh, just to understand where the issues and and uh, and where improvements can be made, uh, and that's expected to be finished in March 2022. And again, here's the the the, uh, the timeline for that. Um, we're we're still in that that uh, initial phase, but we're hoping to have our consultation period uh, sometime in the new year. And then uh, the big one, uh, the, the, the third component, and this is the, the one that takes the longest, of course, is the comprehensive zoning bylaw update. So uh, drafting a single comprehensive zoning bylaw for the entire township. Of course, there are four separate zoning bylaws uh, from former municipalities that are still in full, for, full force and effect. So the biggest thing, obviously, is bringing those four together, creating one streamlined document that has that's um, standard and consistent provisions and regulations. Um, and then the other component to this, of course, is implementing the, the official plan. So ensuring that the, the, the zone provisions and, and various zones throughout the township are reflecting what the, uh, the county official plan uh, provides for in its schedules and its, and its uh, policies. Um, and so with, the, with this component, our first consultation, this will be a little more, um, as I said, it's, long, it's lengthier, so there's a little more of a uh, public process involved, of course, as, as required in the Planning Act, but we are going to be conducting initial consultation in January prior to drafting any documents, just to get an understanding as to where things can improve, with, uh, as with the other uh, components of the project, where the issues lie and, and where uh, improvements can be made. And we are expecting to finish that uh, in late summer of 2022. And so as, as with the other ones, starting up, doing our background uh, review, um, and we would have that, hopefully that open house in January. And we would have, what we're hoping for, we would have a, a, a draft zoning bylaw sometime in, in the late uh, winter, early spring. And that would set about the, uh, the process for statutory uh, public meetings and, and, and the like. So that is it. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. And I, as I said, I also have Adrian here uh, with me if, if you do have any specific questions related to the growth readiness. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sounds like a lot of work um, coming forth and this has been a long time in coming. So it's nice to see. Any uh, councillors with a question? Councillor Olmstead, please. 
Uh, hi, Councilor Olmstead here. It actually may be a question for yourself, Ivan, or a combination of. I'm just wondering how or how we're determining um, who we're speaking to with respect to the public. Uh, I did hear. I did hear. Um, sorry, and I forgot the gentleman's name. All of a sudden. <laughs> my apologies. Randall. My apologies. That's okay. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how we're determining uh, who, who we're discussing uh, the, the public consultation with. Thank you. Yeah, if you want, Kent, I'll, I'll go ahead, if you will. And, and ultimately, um, each project, we will consult mainly with the same groups, but we'll also add other groups, if you will. So for the uh, growth uh, readiness strategy, we have had, a, have had a public survey out for the last three weeks. So that was just to the general public to get a sense of, of what they felt were the, the areas of growth that are necessary. And we've also consulted with through interviews with, uh, with some of the stakeholders, business owners uh, in different sectors of the community, so real estate and, and a variety of different sectors. Um, when it comes to the zoning, we're going to have open houses, so that'll be just open to, to anybody. And uh, so the open house and statutory public meetings will just be open to anybody to come and attend and voice any concerns or comments or, or any support to the, to the development application. So uh, stakeholder lists have been formed with, with my support. So I've, uh, they've outlined some stakeholders and I've added some or removed some and the like. So it's been a combination between us and the consultant. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, via Zoom, we have Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson, go ahead, please. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I, the question I had, uh, more probably for Ivan than Kent, but thank you very much for the presentation, Kent. Um, are we going to see draft presentations or part, or is it going to come to Council as, uh, as one single bulk presentation at the completion of the project? Uh, so each project will sort of um, help shape the next project, if you will, to some extent. So when we get the, strat the growth strategy or action plan, uh, in draft form, it will come to council to receive and, and to accept and to adopt, if you will. And once council reviews that, provides comments, and we adopt it, then that'll help shape the next document. So each document will come individually to council for, for to receive or to approve. Thanks. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I, I'm, and Ivan, you know, I, I love I love to get into this stuff, and uh, I'm curious. I just rather, rather than take up time at a council meeting, if there's an opportunity for me to review it before and chat, I'd Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one question. I'm going to point at the CAO. So I'm looking at the timeline here. They're looking at July for completion. Uh, how do we pertain then to uh, lame duck status come the election next year in this report? Uh, you won't be in uh, lame duck would only happen if two thirds, uh, less than two thirds of council uh, is likely not returning. And that date only takes effect at nomination day in August. So you're within that time frame. I know that from a zoning perspective, the goal here is to be inclusive and open for growth. Um, so we're hoping that it's not a divisive uh, thing, but it just took 21 years to get to. So we anticipate that we'll bring the public along through that process, but you will not be lame duck uh, for the statutory public meeting. And um, and I and I and it does not apply to planning matters. Uh, so the, the limitations for lame duck don't apply in this case. So you can continue doing what you need to do. Uh, but the goal is to wrap it up before uh, the kind of summer break. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Kent. Um, enjoyed your presentation and look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Now we move on to 6.1, site control part of lot eight. Whoop, sorry, I missed announcements totally. Um, Revig your announcements, please. I don't have anything at this time. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Olmstead. Yeah, she was easier to follow this time, but <laughs> I have nothing either. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, just just the uh, Santa Claus parades, in one in Beechburg on Saturday and one in Westmeath on Sunday, as well the uh, Farmers Christmas Market is uh, this. Friday and Saturday. And that's all at the fairgrounds? Is that that's right? a, Yes, it is. It's at the fairgrounds. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering at this time, 
uh, or maybe we can discuss later uh, our participation in the parade. I, I take it we're putting a float in, and uh, I'm not sure who's who's in and who's not. I was understanding it was a go, but um, I have nothing to the contrary to say it's not a go. So um, okay. we're all going to show up at uh, five o'clock and go from there. The word Saturday. I like is all. Pardon me. The word all. Um, it's open to all, so I don't know who's okay. going to show up. No, I just wondered how many councillors were going. I, I, there's only a few okay. of us have put our hands up so far, and okay. I think there's four so far. Okay. Okay. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay? Not at this time. Thank you. Councillor Jackson? Not at this time. And on Zoom, Councillor Nicholson? None at this time. Okay, I just have one um, Friday evening at 7 o'clock. There's a tree lighting in Westmeath for anyone who would like to attend. And then, of course, there's parade on Sunday at uh, Westmeath at 5.30. Councillor McLaughlin? When you say the tree lighting, is that the Lights of Hope? Do you they, know when no. that is? Lights of Hope is passed. It's the last Sunday of November. Oh. Yep. I guess I missed it. No, and there's a tree lighting in Westmeath at okay. the arena. Oh, Westmeath. Oh, I thought Westmeath, Friday Friday night. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Now we move on to 6.1 site plan. Westmeath, no, sorry. Westmeath, part of lot 8, Westmeath concession EFC. Recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region authorize a site plan agreement with John and Nellie Bertrand to govern the use of a parking area on the property described as part of lot 8, Westmeath concession East Front C. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Olmstead and Councillor Jackson. And this goes to Ivan, please. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so this, this site plan agreement is a follow-up to as a condition of a severance application. Uh, so through, back in May 2020, um, John and Nellie Bertrand filed an application for severance to create an easement over the lands described uh, to provide for legal water access in favor of their property, which is across the, the road at 373 Lockwood Bay Road. The easement uh, varies in depth, but it's uh, 1.06 acres. Uh, the purpose of the easement will accommodate a portable and floating dock, uh, as well as winter storage area for that dock, a total of five parking spaces, and a, a 20 meter vegetative buffer. So they're gonna uh, retain that, that vegetative buffer, and they're gonna have a three meter meandering path from the parking lot to the, to the dock. Uh, so the plan on your screen here or, or, or an attachment to the report that demonstrates the site plan. Uh, so this will ultimately uh, fulfill, uh, once the site plan agreement is executed by both parties, will fulfill the condition of consent. Um, this matter was considered with the previous approval authority through the County of Renfrew. So once the agreement is, is executed and registered on title, uh, we would confirm uh, fulfillment of that condition to the County of Renfrew. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Councillor Mackay. Wasn't there a bit of a civil war over this? There, there were some letters of concern that were, that were provided to, uh, to, the, um, to the county or the land division committee, if you will, at the county level uh, from some of the adjacent landowners. Uh, the council did review the severance application and did support the approval. And one of the conditions of that approval was the, was the site plan control. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Now we move on to 6.2, Muskrat Lake Development Requirements. Recommendation that the Council of Township of Whitewater Region receive this report and FAQ for information purposes as they provide an update on the development requirements of, for Muskrat Lake. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Mackay, seconder. Councillor McLaughlin, thank you. And this goes to Ivan again. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, so this report is essentially a response to the constraints that we've been hearing from developers and landowners uh, with respect to the installation of new septic systems around Muskrat Lake. So Doug and I have sort of been um, of receiving these concerns and we've, we've sort of taken some steps to try to facilitate uh, development around the lake. So as council is well aware, Muskrat Lake is a, high, a highly sensitive lake and it's, uh, it's deemed at capacity. And that's due to the phosphorus loading and the insufficient dissolved oxygen uh, to support adequate lake trout habitat. 
As part of the official plan amendment number 11, uh, back in 2019, uh, development re requirements were put in place to uh, to provide for certain re restrictions or requirements, if you will, for development and redevelopment within the, around the lake. Uh, development and redevelopment is defined here as new lots, the development of existing vacant lots, so existing vacant lots of record, any alteration or renovation that has the effect of increasing the size of the septic system, so renovation that adds bedrooms and you know, washrooms and the like, and the replacement of an existing septic system. So these all pertain to essentially new septic systems within 400 meters of the shoreline of Muskrat Lake. So those uh, development requirements are summarized as the submission of a water quality impact assessment. Of, the, of the, that assessment, there are two things. One, a site development and mitigation plan. That was pretty straightforward. I mean, property owners can develop a plan showing where the house is gonna go, where the septic's gonna go. Uh, but the, the difficulty here was the septic system designed to use a certain type of soil. Uh, so as outlined in the official plan, they speak of an acid-based B-horizon soil. Um, at, in attachment number one, there's an email from Victor Castro. He's a representative from the Ministry of the Environment. And he provides a detailed description of the chemical composition of this type of soil. Without going into great detail, essentially it's a soil that has low calcium, we're looking for three components here, low calcium and high aluminum and iron. So low calcium deems the, the soil to be acidic and high iron and aluminum allows for that soil to remove phosphorus from the weeping bed so that it doesn't enter Muskrat Lake, if you will. So thus uh, essentially collecting the phosphorus before it, it, could, it could reach the lake. Uh, what staff have done is we, in consultation with Victor from the ministry, we've done some soil sampling around the lake to see if this acid-based B-horizon soil exists. On the map that's in front of you here and, and shown on, on attachment two, uh, these are the sites that we've tested. Uh, so we've gone as far as Bar Line, as far north as Indian Road, as far south as uh, sort of Cedar Haven area, and we went and tested some of the pits over in Beechburg. What we've determined is the soils that are east of Muskrat Lake are generally higher in calcium, so not acidic, and they have a lower iron and aluminum content. I'm talking micrograms per gram, so like it's not, uh, you can't tell just by vis vis visibly looking at the rock. But however, on the east side of Muskrat Lake, we have the, all, the, the ideal soils that we were looking for. Um, so essentially low calcium, high iron and aluminum. So that is is a sort of a benefit to the to the community and those property owners so that they could potentially use the natural soils on their properties to uh, construct their septic systems one thing to note is when you build a septic system you most often have to import soils so we did test uh, mr buchanan's uh, local pits just south of beechburg and we also tested a pit uh, that is held by mr mccray on sturgeon mountain road and the soils from the face of that pit uh, also had the same criteria. So they're all, all to, uh, the, the ideal soils, if you will, to use for these septic systems. So what we've done is we've developed this FAQ. So that's in consultation with uh, CAO Tremblay and CBO Schultz uh, to facilitate uh, this water quality assessment. So we're going to distribute this to uh, the septic designers, to property owners who are seeking to redevelop their properties with a new septic or, or, or install a new septic for new development and try to facilitate uh, the, the redevelopment of their properties. We do have about three septic systems in the queue sort of sitting on my desk and they were waiting for this to sort of get received by council. And once this is, with, once this is received, then we'll circulate this to them and, and this should help them get their development moving forward. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thanks. It's quite a report. Um, any questions? Councillor McLaughlin? Now, and I don't know much about this, Ivan, but there's a peat, peat moss septic system. Is that correct? Do you know what I'm... I, I, I keep forgetting about it, but I don't... I, I know it's there, and I know it was discussed to, uh, to be used around Muskrat Lake. Yeah. Can you further up on that? Yeah, so um, ultimately in conversations with with Victor from the ministry um, at this point in time the only I guess eligible option for septic systems is this acid base B horizon soil that's the only option 
If we weren't able to find this soil in the natural environment, um, then we would examine other types of systems, so more technical, technologically advanced systems. So at this point in time, you're correct, there are other systems that could be used to remove phosphorus, but at this time, the acid-based Bee Horizon soil is the only option around Muskrat Lake. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nicholson on Zoom. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Ivan, I just want to first say, I, I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to use a student in this way and to support the growth of science-based decision-making. So I, I think this was excellent. Um, and I'm glad to see that we've found local solutions for it. Um, my first question though is, is about funding. We offered some kind of subsidy for septic systems around Mus Muskrat Lake, is that correct? Yes, we do. Through our community improvement plan, we do have uh, some grants available for septic systems around Muskrat Lake. Yes. And specifically to support these kinds of requirements. That's correct. So at this, uh, for 2021, the, the grant is 20% of the cost of the septic system up to a maximum of $7,500. Excellent. So not only are we showing or demonstrating the need for it, we're also supporting folks in their efforts to follow these new standards. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Next question is, is this phosphorus loading, I know it's specific to Muscat Lake. Have we considered it for other lakes or rivers in our area or, or should we? And is that a question for later? I, I think that at this stage, only Muscat Lake within the township has been identified as an at capacity lake. And that's as a result of the phosphorus, like you've indicated. Uh, but certainly um, if we are seeking, if, if a, homeowner is seeking to try to reduce their impact on the environment, they could certainly uh, seek to try to use these types of soils for their, for their septic systems. Thanks. Good. Uh, hopefully the public takes, takes uh, take note of, of the research that's been done and, and knows where they can get that stuff naturally. So thanks, Ivan. I appreciate your work. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Councillor Olmstead. Yes, thanks, Ivan. Um, just in, in the FAQs, point number five, need to hire professionals, and I see BCIN. So do, do, do septic systems now have to be approved by somebody with a BCIN? Yes, yeah, so whether you're using this soil or not, if you put in a septic system, you need it to have it designed by somebody who's cert qualified under the Ontario Building Code with a BCIN, yes. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll have a vote. All in favor? All right, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Now we move on to 6.3, tender. Recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the award of tender 2021-20 to Jade Equipment Company Limited for the purchase of a Forex implement boom at a cost of $89,752.32, inclusive of non-refundable HST. Motion and a seconder, please. Reeve Rigier and Councillor Mackay. This goes to Lane, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, so this piece of equipment will go on to our, our uh, uh, one of, uh, of th uh, three graders, um, and it actually will go on to our second oldest machine, uh, which is GR5 uh, 2012 John Deere grader. Um, it, it will replace the GR3 1987 um, Champion grader that was only used for brushing only. Um, the that old grader and also just the brush head will be surplused in 2020. Um, and, the, and the fleet going forward will have three graders um, that I can, can, can actually grade, including one can actually brush with the, this piece of equipment. Um, so it will uh, increase the uh, le uh, level of service in the municipality, because um, currently we do uh, 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 contract out uh, during, the, in the, during the spring months for grading. Um, and then this piece of equipment will uh, help, um, will we'll brush the, the roadway, um, which will help uh, the, uh, our uh, wheeled excavator uh, with a brush head. Um, the uh, tender uh, that was provided um, by Jade Equipment um, was reviewed by our two mechanics, uh, Terry O'Malley and Dustin Deneau. Um, <coughs> And sorry, and uh, so the, the next step, um, if council seems to uh, to to, uh, to go ahead with this report, is, is to go ahead and and, and purchase the uh, equipment. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? 
Seeing none, we'll have a vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. We move on to 6.4. Uh, mount, trailer mounted hot box. A recommendation of the Council of Township of Whitewater Region approve the award of tender 2021-10 to Amico Construction Equipment Inc. for the purchase of a 2022 Falcon two-ton Falcon asphalt recycler and hot box trailer at a cost of $54,792.67, including options inclusive of non-refundable HST. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Mackay and Councillor Jackson. This goes back to Lane, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this equipment, um, we, we were hoping the department is to purchase during uh, the summer months. Um, um, and the one issue during the, the summer we had was uh, changing our staff. Um, we, we wanted to go out and, and, and do, do much research we, as we can. Um, and we, the plan was to invite uh, different, different manufacturers and, and, and actually uh, 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 demo the equipment. Um, we did have one company uh, when we started out. We demoed, uh, demoed for uh, uh, I, think it was, I think it was about a week and a half. We, we, we demoed it, and staff felt that it, it was that it, w it would work. Um, and, and then one of the, and what else we what, what, um, and just with the with the summer how it went with all the projects and with the uh, staff changes, um, we were unable to 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 invite more more uh, companies. Um, but, but, but we did uh, view uh, uh, naming with uh, municipalities and, and do, do a lot of research between myself and the, uh, the fleet mechanic. Um, <coughs> so one of the items, um, options that we provided, um, the big ranging and a trailer mount bo uh, hot box. Um, one of the items that we, when we first put uh, this put this uh, uh, equipment together. We didn't realize that um, there's, there's a trailer mount, and then there's also a dump box. Um, so through our, through our research and, and and actually demoing the one piece of equipment, um, we found that a hot box a hot box with a dump box would be a lot more efficient. Um, additionally to that, um, uh, one of the options that we we tendered for was the attack coat spring. Um, so that we can actually um, tack coat the actual saw cut uh, area. So we, 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 um, we have a lot, a uh, large uh, cut open. We can we can tack coat the edges, and and, and bond better. Um, sorry, my notes. Um, so some of the other options that we that we we looked at, um, which are this is more of a higher end uh, purchase. And then a, then a regular standard uh, hot box. Um, one of the items was, was a, a mount for our, our, our compactor, so we can so staff can instead of pulling it off, they can have it uh, um, hydraulically lifted off, so we can actually uh, uh, plate pack or, 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 or roller pack the uh, the coal patch like the the potholes. Um, one of the big difference between there's two different standards of uh, like heating sources. Um, um, so it all is by diesel, but um, how it's heated, the actual hopper, how it's heated, the, the air-based and an oil, oil jacket-based. Um, staff felt that going with the uh, with oil jacket-based, which what, that we have here, we tendered for, um, it lasts longer. Um, but the downfall com compared to air, that air he uh, heats up quicker. But we felt with the uh, the, the um, if it's cold patch or, or hot mix, um, with the with the the lengths of um, the, 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 uh, how big the, the municipality is, that it would it'd be more cost effective and, and um, be better on fuel to do with the oil jacketed. Um, so some of the other items um, that we looked for, that, we've, that we added on, we looked for was a, a 24 hour timer. So that the, the piece of equipment can be filled the, the night before and it would start up, um, say now before the staff get there and they can actually then be, be all really warm before they go out. Um, <coughs> and, and even simple uh, uh, items that most of them don't have uh, uh, um, hydraulic uh, 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 loading doors. So you think that it is a large piece of equipment, so that it's heavy. Um, so we asked for that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we feel that, and staff went over the over the bids, and we felt that this is the actual um, um, a hot box that that we need to uh, carry forward for to to maintain uh, uh, maintain the uh, uh, the road and. And also with, with this product here, we actually went out because there's different, um, th this hot box here will actually, will take um, um, used, uh, not used, where um, um, asphalt and actually heat it um, and, and we can place it back down. So it's actually a hot box and, and a um, asphalt uh, recycler. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot of information to intake. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Rumstead. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that. It, uh, so it is coming with the tax spray um, option? Correct, yeah. And speaking to a lot of municipalities, um, and even with the manufacturer, it, um, they said it's, it's coming more and more. Um, a lot of people don't, but I think, for, especially for the, the big patches, um, and, it, and even time we do like, um, you say you hire a, a do like a large patch if you hire a, like a paving company. Right. Um, it, it, they, they tack coat it so it, it bonds the old surface to the new asphalt. So is this something you can use for say the the um, the edges of a double surface treated road? Like I, I, I've mentioned a couple of times, a real concerns over some of our double surface treated roads that they seem like they're not holding up, but a lot of it does seem to start in the edges of the road. Uh, it's not like they're just it's falling away falling off the road so would you would you be using this tax spray option to actually um, do the edges and hold that together um typically we, if we to to fix the uh the, the dst road with the edges because it, it is quite large usually um we, we could spray it down um but we should typically we would use a a loader to put down the actual amount of it because it's so large and doing it by hand um, the one advantage, one thing that we're like we're improving is the actual widening a little bit of road a little bit to have some shoulder of the DST. Because um, some of the we noticed some of the um, like the roads it's actually um, why it's, it's coming off because it, it, it is narrow narrow to the shoulder, and also um, p painting a, a white line the edge of the road to so actually push traffic away from the edge. Right, and if I may. Um, one more. I, I did notice um, on Olmsted Jeffrey Lake, I guess it's Kavanaugh that's doing that. That's correct. That there's quite a section in there that they actually sprayed um, where they, they've got a pile of rock on the, I guess, east side. And they, they've sprayed probably, I want to say about a six foot wide section in the ditch. Um, so is that something that they would have done with something like this taxpayer? Um, it's a different, um, it's a different product. Um, um, one thing we can look into if it is compatible or not. Uh, I'm actually, I'm not sure, but I'll write it down and get back to you on that one. Yeah, so typically you spray. Um, it's more, that's more of a. Um, yeah. That's a big spray out of a truck. Yeah, th this here is more oh. a, a emulsion product, so it's a right. bonding agent, where that is a. Um, it's more of a uh, liquid asphalt, um, which they, they do it to spray the the, 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 uh, the the granular material so it doesn't wash away. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on Zoom, Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, Lane, I appreciate the uh, the detail on that, and uh, it sounds like a great piece of equipment. I just uh, I received quite a few um, uh, calls from residents and feedback about potholes on on some of our, our DST roads. This will aid us in providing support to maintain those. And uh, is it more efficient to use this? Can you can you amplify on that, please? Uh, yet, um, especially this time of year, we do have multiple in this one crew. Um, so this will be, um, we only have one in the fleet, um, but it will help, especially with the, um, having the ability to, to uh, roll a pack or, or, or to pack the actual pothole. Um, with the, having this equipment, it can actually, um, uh, be easy for staff to to actually get get the packer off um, the, the off the off the trailer on to, to actually onto the road. Um, you, you can respect it. if we do it now. We got to pull it off our truck, um, lifting it off three feet off the ground. Where this would be actually be right on the ground, so they can pick it up, put it on, and and the actual be actually being the product actually being hot. Doesn't matter if it's 
cold mix or hot mix. Um, the product help will actually help bond bond better, and then if we do use the emulsion product, um, it will improve the roads and help bond it longer, hopefully. Awesome. So it's $55,000 investment in getting our roads fixed better, specifically potholes in, in this case. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Link. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay. Uh, Lane, will this be used like, you know where you cut out the, at the rink, you cut out that big strip, could you fill out with that? Would that be a good use for that? Yeah, and it, um, again, we're, our, our staff are not, we're not um, um, asphalt pavers, per se. Yeah. But uh, definitely with this product, we can go up to our local, uh, we do have lo some local uh, um, asphalt plants that we can go pick up the product and it'll stay warm, it's still hot until we get it down. Yep. Um, then we can actually use a roller, for example, and, and get it um, smooth. We, we wouldn't be large patches, per se. We would hire that out. But especially for smaller patches like that one, we, 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 we could do it with this. All right. Good enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Concerns? Nothing? All in favor? Carried. Right, thank you. Now we move on to <coughs> section three, or item 6.5. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region 1 authorize the treasurer through section 357-358 of the Municipal Act 2001 to process the cancellation, reduction, or refunds of the property taxes for certain properties in the amount of $11,682.38 for years 2018 through 2021, and two, delegate the authority to hold meetings and make decisions pursuant to sections 357 and 358 and 359 to a review panel comprised of the treasurer, deputy CAO, Deputy Treasurer and Council's Financial and Administrative Liaison. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Mackay and Councillor Jackson. And this goes to um, Sean. Sorry, I have Kim wrote down, but Kim's not here. Sean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this should be a pretty quick one, uh, a quick two-parter here. Um, the first part is we had uh, 26 Section 357 applications um, this year. Uh, we already brought three earlier in the year. Um, and then three came back with um, with no assessment change. So this report speaks to 20 of them. Our portion of taxes written off is uh, just under 11,000. Um, for the county, be just under 7,000. For the school board, it would be about 6,500. Um, and then the second part to that is uh, the, la the last time we brought this, I think it was in April, um, they suggested that we look at alternatives instead of bringing them to council. Um, so the other part of it is we're suggesting or recommending that council delegate this to the treasurer, deputy treasurer, and the, f uh, the finance lead, council's finance lead, um, and then they wouldn't have to come back to the council table at that point. So with that, I'll turn it back to the chair for any questions. Okay, thank you. Questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, right, thank you. Now we're going to 6.6. Uh, 2022 off-duty accident and sickness. Recommendation of the Council of Township of Whitewater Region approve the 2022 proposed for on-duty and off-duty accident and sickness insurance, bracket plan one, with Providence for the fire department personnel. Motion and a seconder, please. Pardon? Pardon? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're good, you're good. Okay. Sorry, uh, Councillor Mackay, and who is the seconder? Reed Brigier, okay, thank you. And this goes to Rob, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to point out we're not changing the coverages, uh, but we did want to make sure at renewal that it was a competitive uh, competitive bid. So, um, so to the existing VFIS and then Provident, and then you can see the plan under plan one, um, it's, it's, it's cheaper, um, and I should say the dollar amount is well within uh, staff's delegated authority, but because it's a change in provider, we brought it forward to council, just so you knew. But you'll see uh, for the on-duty, there's, um, there's some extra coverage with the lesser premium with Provident. Um, and then uh, the dollar amount for the same coverage for off-duty is just uh, cheaper per member from 73 to 57. So the, uh, the total savings are about $2,600 for 2022, um, and that's the recommendation. 
Okay, thank you. Any questions? Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, just under background, just trying to understand um, the, the first sentence there, and in brackets, member only. Can you just kind of fill me in on that? So Canada for on-duty and off-duty member only accidents and sickness insurance? So uh, back in the day, we used to, uh, members of uh, the fire team had to sign up for this. So any member that's a member of the fire department is covered. So we only cover for the fire member. If they want to extend to like family coverage, they pay that premium separately. But oh. so we only pay for the, the member, the member of the fire department. Right, not the family. Yep. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, 6.7, changes to council composition. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the mayor serving on Rimford County Council effective the 2022 election with the deputy mayor replacing them in their absence when required. Motion and a seconder, please. Councilor Jackson and we need a seconder. Councillor Mackay, thank you. And this goes back to Rob, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we did a 30-day consultation period that the clerk uh, undertook, and we sought council's feedback, but also did some notices uh, publicly. So we did get some responses. Um, we did uh, receive one former member of council who said that um, combining the positions would be um, would not be supported because of time constraints, uh, but on the whole, there wasn't um, much opposition to the idea of sending the mayor to the county council for the for the arguments that were raised uh, when the notice of motion uh, to go forward with consultation uh, was raised. Uh, so that's why that motion is before you. Uh, once that motion is dealt with, uh, should it pass, uh, then uh, council will need to decide what to do with the deputy mayor position and replacing the Reeve. So you'll notice on uh, kind of the third page, just before strategic plan, departmental work plan, there's three draft motions there. Um, we removed the fourth option about um, the uh, the councillor with the most votes be appointed as the deputy mayor because that wasn't supported. But there's three options here um, about the deputy mayor, either selection uh, with an election at large or appointment by council at the inaugural meeting or appointment on a rotating basis uh, for one year at a time, the four councillors that received the most votes. Um, so the first matter of business is whether or not the mayor uh, is to serve on county council, and that's the motion you have on the table. Once, so you would speak to the merits of that and then vote, and then following that, you'd, uh, somebody would have to move and second one of those three motions outlined on page three of the report. And I should just say in terms of next steps, once council tonight gives that direction, the clerk will bring forward the necessary bylaw at the next meeting. And those changes, if, if passed, would take effect uh, at the next election. Okay, thank you. So now we'll open it up to questions. Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, so should part of that not also state that um, I assume the, the, there will no longer be a reposition? So, so the first motion speaks to the mayor going um, to the county. And once that happens, if that happens, then you have to talk about the reef position. And one of those three motions deals with that, replacing the reef with a six councillor. So the first one has to do with who's going to the county. If that passes, then one of those three draft motions I prepared would deal with the replacement of the reef position. So you'll see the, the three are, yeah. if you see it right there, and the, they're worded in such a way about replacing the reef position should you decide to send the mayor to the county. Okay, yeah, I, now I see your logic. <laughs> I see, I, we, I, I, staff I see didn't, your Yeah, I, staff didn't want to take a position on that because there wasn't unanimity, so it's really for council to decide how it wishes to proceed. But I think if you should just deal with the mayor part first and then get to the deputy mayor, if that passes. Can I ask who's running for mayor next election? <laughs> Get. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Nicholson, please. My question has to do more with the deputy mayor position. Uh, I don't have any questions with respect to the first first motion. Oh, so mayor, I'll wait. I'll wait till we get to that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Mackay. I think it's a good idea, but I get worried about maybe people who are working. 
would they be able to take the position as mayor because you know the council meeting for the counties during the day so that's the only thing i kind of think about so it eliminates a lot of people out of that job and that's something that happened previously and that's why it was changed i don't know so, yeah okay all right so um, sometimes it depending on the the term of council whatever that was and who ran in the election and whom was elected at the time so depending on on who went so Councillor McLaughlin thank you uh, I, I've been on council and it's been both ways the only thing that I will say is that if you're going to send your mayor to County Council then you're eliminating a lot of people uh, that would run for that position any working person probably would not run for that position because there's uh, and uh reaver Aguirre could i know if count does county meet twice a month she's nodding her head yes so that would be 20 no that wouldn't be because there's two months is it two uh, is there 20 many 20 meetings county meetings uh, all I'm saying is that there's a lot of people uh, and we've had former mayors that would run for mayor as long as they didn't have to run for county to go to the county as well that that's all I, I'm and, and much to what uh, Councillor Mackay saying when we first decided that we would go we would split it up it was because of the meeting the number of meetings uh, as well as the workload and that's why it was split up that that was the reason it was told to me and now we're going to go back changing it back I, I don't know whether are you going forward or are you going backwards it's it's hard to say that that was the reason I don't want to see I want to see the best people possible in the positions that they want and I realize Councillor Regier will say that she attends county but there's certain things certain committees that she's not allowed to sit on and I asked the question why could we change it and the answer was no we couldn't change it that those those meetings are set for the mayor so I I, I sit both ways I just want to see the best person possible put their names forward for the job I I don't know it, it it's been 12 12 years this uh, since since we changed it I think so I think it was 2010 is that uh, Rob is that correct it was 2010 when the first Reeve I believe sent so to County Council Yes. Yeah. So we've been going 12 years, and I don't know. Um, I can I can go both ways, either way. So, and I've said that to the reef when I, she asked me. Uh, I I really don't have an opinion on it, other than I want to see the best person possible, and I don't want to see that person burnt out because they have so many meetings that that's all they're doing is doing meetings and not having any time for themselves thank you Reeve gear thank you so i will start off by answering uh councillor mcquat uh, mclaughlin's uh, question there is committee meetings that are held i sit on two different committee meetings at the county and then there is a day of county council so there is generally um with that there's three that I am that I'm there for all the time every month in addition to I do sit with the Renfrew County District Health Unit so we do have ad hoc committees that we are in addition to so yes that is time-consuming um, and no doubt as far as running for the best position I think when you run for that position you have to have that expectation that it is time-consuming and you do have to have that commitment I don't see it any other way. Um, uh, I mean, it, it comes down to <laughs> whether you're an employer or whatever 
can work around it. I mean, you've got to make that decision if you're running, I guess, is what I'm saying for that. And um, right now, sitting at county, there are 12 elected officials that are mayors. And they, are, they can maintain it. They, I'm assuming, I, I can't speak on their behalf, but there are 12 sitting there at this point in time. So again, it's your decision if you're gonna, if you wanna do it, you can, uh, you have that option. But there are 12 sitting there filling that position. And one of the reasons, and I think moving forward for Whitewater Region, like things are working well, I'm not saying it's not, but I would just like to see us moving forward I think in the mayor's seat, when you're sitting at that county level, you have the full picture. You don't have, I don't feel, I didn't have the full picture of everything going on around me when, I, when you're not in the mayor's seat. And that was, that's just something that I see personally, and I'm not saying for the other Reeves that are there, absolutely, it may work for them, that's fine, but just where I sit, I still think that sitting at the head of the table for the county with Whitewater Region in the mayor's position will still give the full picture and, and I, I am supporting this 100%. Thank you. Councillor Olmstead and then Councillor uh, Jackson. Yeah, just uh, actually two things. One, is I'd actually like to hear from the mayor himself, his opinion about it, and two, um, just whoever brought the motion forward, I'd like to understand the thinking behind it. I'm not sure. Or was this Rob? Did you bring it? No, Count, oh, Councilor Jackson. Oh, Councilor Jackson? Yeah. Councilor Nicholson. Okay. Okay. So you want to hear from Councilor Jackson next? She did have her hand. Yeah, up. perfect. And then okay. uh, I actually want to hear the mayor's thoughts about it as well. Okay. And then we have Councilor Nicholson and then myself. Councilor Jackson, please. I think. Um, I brought it forward after consultation with our current Reeve. Um, I think it's important um, that the head of council fully understand and fully um, participate at the county level. I think it's important that um, they're getting elected as the spokesperson on behalf of the township, the mayor is. The Reeve is as well at the county level, which is a, a, a different level of government and different expectations. But when you have the spokesperson for the township sitting at the county table, I think it goes a longer way in some instances. I don't wanna speak on behalf of any other township or, um, or why they choose to do that. A lot of the, a lot of the decisions have been made with who may or may not run, and therefore, Councillor McLaughlin saying he wants to know that the best person is running for the job. Well, as we know, everybody puts their best foot forward when it comes to election. It's up to the electors to vote who they think is the best person. It may not be who you think the best person is. So that's totally up to the electors. As far as time commitment, um, the Reeve, um, has the same time commitment. There might be a little bit more, there is a little bit more with regards to the mayor's participation. But when you're the Reeve, you're sitting there and you know that you can't work full time because there is that time commitment during the day. So whether or not it's the Reeve's position or the mayor's position sitting there, it's the same type of commitment. In our case, what has happened is the Reeve has been very much involved in everything, pretty much everything that our mayor has been involved with at the township level. And this is why I brought it forward. We didn't elect two mayors. We elected one mayor and one reeve. And that's important to note that um, if we're going to have the participation of the reeve continue as it has been over these last three years in the day-to-day -day operations that normally just the mayor is involved in, then that's a different story than we can do mayor and reeve. But because of the situation that has gone on during this 
um, council, I would have to say, why are we having two um, people attending so many things? When the voters have elected a mayor to be that person. So why should the voters, they didn't elect the Reeve to attend to mayor duties, they elected the Reeve to attend to Reeve duties at the county council. So that's the reason why, one of the reasons why I considered it. And um, after, certainly it was a recommendation that came as well from Reeve Rager herself, and I said I would bring that motion forward on behalf of her. And um, I support that uh, decision. And moving forward, I think it should be the spokesperson for Whitewater Region that sits at the county council table. Thank you. Councillor Nicholson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, more of a procedural question. I don't know if uh, the clerk or the CAO is best to answer it, but um, does, assuming the mayor became the single point, there was no reeve in the future. Um, can the mayor, does the mayor have the authority within his position to, you know, turn to Council Armstead and say, hey, Council Armstead, can you be on this committee for me? And I don't have time to attend the health unit one, or can you sit in for me this week at the county council? If the mayor is not available, is it an empty seat or can he designate someone to attend on his behalf? Uh, so maybe I can respond to that. So the municipal act was changed to allow that there be an alternate for the, the upper tier seat. So as of now, that's Councillor Olmstead. Reeve Rigger has been punctual and fully available and has not necessarily hasn't uh, used Councillor Olmstead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's not meant to be a switcheroo. It's meant to be uh, the mayor or the Reeve or whoever's going to county council has an illness and here's the backup person that would be authorized to attend. It's not meant to be there's a there's a whitewater person who can go and sit on a committee. So it's it's indirect election. So basically the constituents of Whitewater Region, whoever they decide, whoever council decides goes to the county, they're indirectly elected to serve on that body. So they're ultimately responsible for serving on that body. What the alternate does is just in, in case of illness or extended absence or anything of that nature, they would go. But with a hybrid and technology that we've learned through the pandemic, I'm not even certain that's happened at county council where somebody else has sat for, for another member. It just doesn't happen. However, um, should this motion pass, the deputy mayor would be act in the absence of the mayor, but um, would not be the mayor, would just act in his or her absence. So, so to your question, no, not to that extent, although there's opportunities for an alternate in case of illness or extended absence. No, thanks. I appreciate that. And that's an important distinction. Um, yeah, so we are going to be demanding a lot of that position. But I, I, the more I listen to Councillor Jackson and the Reeve on this, um, it, I think the authority needs to vest, the sole authority needs to vest in one spot. And, and that comes at a risk of, of like Councillor McLaughlin pointed out, um, maybe then somebody who works full time can't do that representation. But like you just pointed out, Rob, um, we the mayor is a full-time position. I mean, they're on call for whatever might come up. Um, so if they are working full-time and, and, and couldn't handle um, that kind of, of meeting requirements, maybe that's not the position they should be running for. That, that's just my thoughts, and I don't want to exclude anybody, but that's I'm kind of thinking out loud. So uh, I'll, I'll off, let other people offer their thoughts and opinions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's quite a, a lot to digest. Um, um, having hearing uh, the previous meeting when this was brought up and it was discussed and now it's being discussed again, um, I myself understand where Reeve Rigier is coming from. She's sitting at the county seat, so she understands what's going on at county, but she doesn't see what's happening in this building because she's not here. 
um, and, and not in touch with some of the stuff that the mayor is. So, and the same holds true with what Reeb Rigger is seeing at county. The mayor has no idea what's going on. So it works both ways. So I do see the advantages of having one person attend both meetings and then having your alternate, if so be that that's the way it goes. Um, that is also all decided at inauguration time. Uh, everybody gets their marching orders after um, we all get swore at. Uh, at that time, and then the committees, et cetera, are, are delegated. Um, and that would be something that would have to be changed at the time. If that mayor is uh, not able to sit at county, perhaps for work environment or whatever, um, that would something would have to come up. Is that correct, Rob? Uh, no. So if the mayor is to, to serve on county council, they would go on county council. However, I should point out that you as mayor sit on three or four other bodies. Um, so the likelihood is maybe the mayor would not serve on the museum or the library board. Other members of council would step up and serve on those bodies because the mayor would have responsibilities for attending council meetings and just overall direction and responsibilities under the act. So to your point about inaugural meeting and deciding who serves on what, maybe the mayor is not the one on the library board or the museum or the watershed. Other councillors might have to be appointed to that. So it's, it's about sharing the, the load. So with the passing of this bylaw, then um, it stays for perpetuity until changed, meaning the mayor goes to county. Yes, so council uh, has the authority to change its compositions. It just has to do it in the year before an election. So should the next council say you, you pass this, should the next council change its mind, it can pass a similar bylaw for the, for the 2026 election and change it, just like they did in 2009 where the... The warehouses from Councillor Jackson, I added those to provide everybody the history, but council composition has changed like four or five times already. Um, so it's not, council's always kind of trying to find the right fix and has changed, had words, doesn't have words, had nine, is down to seven. So each council can decide uh, its future composition. Okay, I have two concerns. One is um, the concern that the mayor doesn't know what's happening at county and the county doesn't know what's happening, vice versa. And the other concern is um, at what point then is this working towards a full-time job? Right now it's considered part-time, right? It's not. So I think Councillor Jackson made the argument that the Reeve sits here and sits at the county already. So you already have a, uh, a member of council serving in both places. And I think this is a question for a council remuneration that you're obligated to look at at every uh, once per term and to determine what the workload is and what is the remuneration that should come with that. But the mayor is to be available, not just for evening meetings, is to be available at other times during the day, regardless of other things happening in their lives. But right now we have whoever goes to the county also serves here. So you already have one position doing double duty. Okay, I understand. You answered my question. So, um, I don't know, from where I sit, I, I, I really can't see, see it being a problem if I was to get rid of some of my other committees that I'm on. Um, it does free up more time. So, um, not fully understanding, I know some of the days at county are eight hours and maybe longer, and then, I don't know, Reeve, how long are committee meetings or ad hoc? Are they an hour, two hours, three hours? Uh, they generally run around two to three hours, and it will be on. I I have I sit on two different committees on two different days. Yeah. So it's uh, so it's it, it's that it, commitment. It, it doesn't certainly does work into monopolizing some of the time, but um, um, I think it would be good for the county to uh, work with a mayor at least for a term, maybe, and uh, maybe at that point then it could go back to Reeve or whomever at the time that that council decides what the makeup would be. So. Um, that's about all. I hope I made that clear to everyone. Councillor Olmstead has hand up first. I think uh, Councillor Mackay did. I, I saw him there before. But uh, then, then I'll go after Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Mackay, please. Okay, my question is to Rob. Like, if we decide, say this, we came back here and then this, uh, the election had gone, we can make a decision to change it, but it won't come through to the next series. Okay, all right. Thank you. That's for a four-year term, unless changed during the council time period. Next yeah. For the next term. For the next term, yeah. Okay, Councillor Olmstead. I, uh, I have to admit, I was initially thinking uh, more along the lines of Councillor Mackay and Councillor McLaughlin that I'm a bit nervous of somebody um, not being able to um, commit the time to 
um, the the county. But having discussed tonight, I actually have, I've changed my opinion in that um, the mayor's position, especially now, like our, our region is growing at such a rate. Um, um, we're dealing with big budgets now, and it's it's damn near a full-time position. I, I don't want people to run for the mayor's position uh, on a frivolous uh, opportunity that maybe they shouldn't be, you know, they're not qualified for, for the position or they shouldn't be running for the position or they don't have the background to run for the position or you know, some kid comes into town and he's just going to, he decides he's going to run, um, which we've seen before. So I, I, I'm actually changed my opinion that... Um, I think the, the position uh, should be held with esteem, uh, both in Whitewater and the county level. So uh, actually, I'm going to support the motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Councilor McLaughlin. Okay, uh, just, just in what I've been hearing here, uh, one thing I, you said, maybe you shouldn't sit on the committees. Maybe if the Reeve is finding that it's too much, of a job, maybe those committees could be freed up. Um, just, just thinking like, uh, much like I, I, I'm more to the, I want to have, and if the job is that much, then we're going to, if the mayor's job is a full-time job, and then we're going to shove them onto the county as well, are we overloading? Are, are we doing that? Um, I, I, heard, I heard the discussion before on the wise, and I knew the wise, uh, and I'm hoping that's not the wise this time. Um, I, I'm hoping that people are thinking for the better of the, the Whitewater region. That's what I'm hoping. Um, uh, other than that, I want, I want to see the best idea for Whitewater region, not because I want to do something, uh, and uh, I can't, so uh, that's because I sat the last time and I argued this. I didn't want, I thought, the mayor, why can't you go to county council? Well, they, they had lots of reasons. There's always lots of reasons for everything. So, um, and one of the reasons were we wanted to lower the composition. So this was the way of doing it. That's how it all started. If you want, and I'm sure everybody knows the history and the background. I don't have to go over that uh, at all. We know why it happened, and I'm just hoping that's not the why at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Reeve Rigger. Thank you. I'll just finish this um, uh, one final note. First of all, Councilor McLaughlin, I, uh, I do not, I, don't, I do have time to fill this position as Reeve. I, I, I have all along. Um, when I started off, I was working part-time, and three days a week, and I couldn't keep up with it. So that was a decision that I made, and I made it happily, and um, I, I've never looked back on that. And um, yeah, I just, I just want to say that I have also filled the position of human resources here in Whitewater Region. That has been a huge responsibility turnover is stuff, anything else that's going on, and have maintained that as well. So I think with whoever is elected as mayor, I think that they should, they will probably still be able to fill that, uh, fill that position. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seeing nothing else, I guess we're going to vote on this motion of, help me out here, Rob, we're going to vote on this motion of mayor going to county council. Yes. We're not voting on anything else at this time. So the motion stands. No changes. Reeve Rigier. I wonder if we should maybe have a recorded vote just because of the, uh, the okay. importance of this decision. Okay. So I looked at the clerk then and asked her to perform a recorded vote. Now, I don't know if the first person. It would be um, Reeve Rigier. Okay. So Reeve Rigier. In favor. Um, Councillor Nicholson. In favor. Um, Councillor Olmsted. In favor. Councillor Jackson. In favor. Councillor McLaughlin. In favor. 
Councillor Mackay? Yeah, I'm in favour too. Mayor Moore? In favour. Perfect. So that passes. Yeah, it's passed. Thank you. Um, so now we have to decide. Okay, now we'll go back to Rob. Please help us out here on what we're going to decide next. Sure. So now you need a mover and seconder for one of these options. So once the option's on the table, you could debate it, vote it up or down. But you'll need a mover and seconder for one of them. So the three options are replacing the Reeve with a deputy mayor elected at large. The second one is appointment replacing the Reeve with a sixth councillor and that the deputy mayor position be appointed by council from amongst the member at the inaugural meeting. Or third, that the Reeve be replaced with a sixth councillor and that the deputy mayor position be appointed by council at the inaugural meeting on an annual rotation of the four councillors having received the most votes. So election at large, appointment by council or appointment on rotation basis. So you just need, uh, so the wording, the draft wording is included here. You just need a mover and seconder for one of the options to discuss it and then vote it up or down. And if it doesn't get majority support, you'd go to another option. Okay, that's a lot to dissect okay. as well. So we'll open it up to the floor and I'm looking at Councillor Olmstead had his hand up first. So do I need to, um, just a point of order, so do I need to, um, before I speak to anything, I have to move something? So my, my hope was actually to speak to eliminate one of them. Is that possible or not? No, so somebody who believes strongly <laughs> <laughs> the one of the options should be considered should put it on the floor and then you can debate kind of okay. all the options and vote on that one if it doesn't have the majority then you would go to another option okay. so you probably won't even have to touch the one you don't want to talk right. about okay I, yeah okay then I'll I'll, uh, I'll end it there thank you so with that I will make the motion uh, for election at large at the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region, approve replacing the reef position with a deputy mayor position elected at large. And I would move that motion forward. If I so we seconder. need a seconder. Seconder is... I'll Count second it, Mayor. Oh, Councillor oh. Jackson had her hand up first, sorry. Because you're right in front of me, you're on that little screen that Carmen have set up, so I'm looking dead on at you. <laughs> Okay, so now we go to debate, right? We have questions. We have a motion and a seconder. So questions on uh, what the Reeve just uh, said, election at large. No, any questions? This is where we debate th that. Councillor Olmstead. I just want to say that's the one that I didn't have an issue with. So, uh, <laughs> I can support that one, yes. <laughs> Councillor Olmstead, no, what's your name? Nicholson. Did you have your hand up? Sorry, I lost sight of the screen for a minute. I'm gonna write it right here. No, um, thanks Mayor. The, I just wanted to talk about the election at large thing and it kind of stems back from the CAO's points when we spoke earlier about that delegated authority, who the mayor could appoint to replace him as an alternate county council. Um, and I also think that when we think about the deputy mayor, um, I think we need to recognize the importance of the position. If the mayor was to resign, get sick or be unavailable during an emergency, um, we have to think about, should it be someone that we're appointing as council to backfill for him or is it, should it be someone that's been voted in by the community? And for that reason, um, I'd like to see it at large so that the community has an opportunity to vote in someone that they believe could replace the mayor if necessary. And I'm assuming I got that procedure right, Rob. If not, correct me. But uh, it gives it it lends its community weight to the position. So Rob can correct me now if I'm wrong. He can said no, so I guess you're correct. Okay, thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Okay, uh, now you've got it. This is just about as clear as mud to me. Uh, I understand the deputy mayor, and my problem at putting the deputy mayor at large is that there more than likely is going to be one, two, three councillors run for, for that position. And there's only going to be one that gets, that will have that position. So there'll be two councillors and, and that's just your own choice. 
will, will, will be lost. They, they, they won't be on council anymore. Uh, the, to, the other thing is, and I, and I don't think the deputy mayor, if for some reason that the mayor resigns or passes, for some reason the, the, the position becomes vacant, does the deputy mayor at that point become the mayor? And people are shaking their head, and I'm going to tell you different, that I don't think they do. But I, I'd like that answered from Rob before I go any further. Uh, so any vacancy that occurs on council, council has a certain uh, time frame to declare the seat vacant and and either appoint a replacement or do a by-election. I think Councillor Nicholson's point, if I can interpret what he was trying to say, is that if the community at large elected a deputy mayor, the thought would be the council should consider that person to replace the mayor, but that would be in the hands of council. Per the Municipal Act, you have, you have 60 days to declare the, the seat vacant, and then you either have to appoint or, or, or uh, go through a by-election. So the whole point, though, is that the deputy mayor, I think, would be responsible at home, which I would call in Whitewater Region, or at the county to replace, to represent the mayor should the mayor not be available. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the role of the deputy mayor, would be to, uh, to replace in the absence of. Just to reply to your uh, statement, I think in the former township of Ross, the the reeve at that time passed and at that time then council the deputy mayor did not step up because that was not the wish of council that they they went to uh, the council and everybody had their chance if i understand and i i don't know the whole story and there's nobody around this table that that can answer that one for me but it ended up being one of the councillors took over the Reeves position. Maybe Councillor Jackson could fill me in more if she, if she knows some of that. But okay, Councilor Jackson. that's where I was coming from. So the same rule applied back then. That was when um, Reeve Aldi May passed during uh, his time as Reeve. And the same thing happened. So it was probably put out to council because they have 60 days and whether it was 60 days at the time i think it was that they have 60 days to appoint and then um that they could appoint the reeve and then they could also appoint um somebody else to sit on council you didn't necessarily have to go to a by-election so in laurentian valley we had that issue where a councillor um was ill and decided to withdraw from sitting on council and council had the opportunity at that time because it was part way through um, to either appoint a person take nominations from um, anybody that was interested and then council could appoint um, and then or do a by-election and Laurentian Valley Council at the time decided to appoint a former councillor to sit in that councillor's position. So the same thing could occur, is my understanding, with regards to if a mayor was unable to fulfill his duties and um, was vacant from the position. It's totally different than being away for a couple of meetings or a month due to illness or whatever. You know, you're away for a month, you're not giving up your seat. Um, it's only after two months of vacancy that council would have to decide whether or not they want to extend that vacancy and allow them to be vacant. The person is, you know, going to be back in two weeks after the two months. Then council can make that decision or they appoint a new person and then appoint a further councillor to replace the councillor that has been placed as the mayor. Or you do a by-election for the vacant position. So there's a number of options, but yes, um, during that time um, when Reeve Aldi May passed, um, it was appointed from within. And most council do that because of the cost of a by-election. 
I guess what my point was that uh, it was not assumed that the deputy mayor would just step up. It, it, it's council's wishes. I, I'm, I'm getting that. That that's what I'm getting. Get, trying to understand that the deputy mayor, he fills in, or she, whoever the deputy mayor is, they will fill in the vacancy. But if it's six months or whatever, or, or resignation, it's not right away that they'll assume the position. Is is that? That's what I'm kind of getting. Yes, that's uh, I'm correct. Seeing so the, they knobs, have, the vacancy knobs. has to be two months or more. Council has to make a decision whether or not they want to extend that vacancy. But after a vacancy of two months, council has to make that decision what they're going to do with that vacant position um, prior to the two months is up. But until such time, the deputy mayor is assumed the duties of the mayor, and that's the intention of a deputy mayor's mm -hmm. position. Yeah, and I guess my point was that it's not assumed that the deputy mayor is just going to step up. It has to be made by council, and I'm stopping at that. At the point of a vacancy, yes, a full vacancy, yes. But during that period, before their two months is up, the deputy mayor will take the position of mayor, but still be called deputy mayor, until such time that the vacancy is more than two months. If I can just add, um, so the deputy mayor is kind of the acting mayor, so um, fills in as required, but in a vacancy, it's really not this council's decision, it's the council of the time to decide how to fill that vacancy. But I think the deputy mayor would be acting mayor, would serve in the absence of the mayor, whether they, so if they have an extended illness or something of that nature. So you're, you're correct, councillor. It, that that decision on a vacancy lies with the council of the time to make a decision. Okay, Councillor Olmstead. Almost it'll be quick. Um, so does does any vacancy have to be filled, whether it's deputy mayor, mayor, or councillor? Is that or is one of the options that you can leave it vacant? No, you have sixty days to make a decision on. So a councillor can't. So there's a three month rule. If you're gone for three months, you're automatically unless council uh, authorizes you to be gone, the seat uh, becomes vacant, or if there's a conflict of interest act before a judge and they vacate the seat or somebody passes away or resigns, anytime there's a vacancy, somebody's left, resigned, or passed away, or has been removed, council has 60 days to decide what to do, either appoint or pass a bylaw to do a by-election. So seats have to, when there's a vacancy, council must act to fill it. Okay, thank you. Councilor McLaughlin. Now I'm really confused because whenever Ronnie Lowe, who was our deputy mayor, passed, and that was in July, we never filled that position. It's because it was the year of an election. You didn't say that, though. Well, I can't read every extract of the Municipal Act, but in a year of election, you can't have a by-election after March 31st. So in that case, that's likely because oh. it was so late in the term. Okay. But, to, and, um, but yeah. So yes, there are going to be moments, but unless it's March 31st, uh, vacancies are, are dealt with. Okay, that answers my question, then, and, and it kind of clears a little bit. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. I'd like to have a five-minute break. Oh, okay. okay, all right. I hope okay. I can. <laughs> Quick question? Yeah, this is the very last, very last. Um, I just want to say further to Councillor McLaughlin's comment when we are sitting around this table tonight discussing this we have to take the people out of the equation because in 2022 not one single one of us sitting around this table is a guarantee they're going to be here and look at the 2014 election where there were complete councils wiped out so let's just keep that in mind as we're proceeding and moving forward here tonight and I'm done thanks <laughs> okay thank you so seeing no other, no other questions or queries, I'll uh, we'll call for a vote. All in favor on this article that we're voting on. Election at large. Uh, do we need, oh sorry, um, I call for a vote. We don't need a recorded vote on this? Nobody has requested. So a show of hands please. One, two, three, four, motion is passed. Thank you. Now we take five minutes.
Thank you. We are back. 641. And we move on now to item 6.8. Update on arena operations. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region receives this report for information purposes pertaining to 2021-22 arena operations. Motion is seconder, please. Re uh, sorry. Councillor Mackay and Councillor Jackson. And this goes to Jordan, please. All right, thank you. Um, so I just want to bring this report to Council to uh, provide uh, a few updates on operations, uh, staffing, as well as some of the provincial guidelines. And uh, as Council is well aware, in the 2021 budget deliberations, uh, Council did approve that all three arenas would open uh, for this season, the 2021-2022 season. Um, so with plans to open all three arenas, um, we did experience a few delays. I know there was reports that did come to Council, uh, mainly due with water issues at both uh, Beechburg and Westmeath Arena. Um, in addition to this, uh, the Ontario government announced that the proof of vaccination would be re required to participate in certain activities. And um, you know, as you can imagine, uh, this has uh, imposed uh, tighter restrictions on what we've been doing in the world of recreation. Um, with rules in place, uh, staffing retention has been a high priority. Uh, of course, without them, ICE operations uh, cannot proceed. Um, so we were essentially looking at uh, a lot of different efficiencies and whatnot uh, as we moved along and started opening up arenas. And one of the efficiencies that we have been uh, working with to deal with some of the staffing pressures and provincial requirements was we actually pushed back uh, ice rentals by five minutes. So you may remember from last year, we had half an hour gaps to also deal with that as well. Um, this year we were able to tighten that a little bit. Um, we were that much better at our operations and uh, all the different things that were going on in the arenas. And uh, we were able to, uh, to only have a five minute gap. The purpose of the five minute gap is to alleviate a third person on staff, as well as give the operators more time to, um, to deal with flooding and ice preparation. And normally they would have help from a, a rink attendant. So the rink attendant stays at the, at the front full time to deal with um, proof of vaccinations and people coming uh, into our facility. So just uh, despite the, the staffing challenges, uh, we've also had a significant uh, decline in ice rentals. And I wanted to just bring forward um, um, to Council just one of our users who, is, who turns out to be our, our biggest user here in the Township White Water region, which is Minor Muskrat Hockey Association. I thought I just wanted to share this with you guys. Um, so this year, Minor Muskrat actually has one competitive team. Um, so they have one competitive team, and then they have uh, non-competitive teams in all divisions. However, the uh, U18, which is formerly known as Midget, um, they actually uh, didn't have enough players, so they've joined with a neighboring municipality. And really, I guess the question is, what does that mean for us? Well, uh, that means that you know we're losing approximately 15 hours of ice time alone for uh, minor muskrats. So when you start to do the math and you start to look at uh, the months that were open, um, you know those numbers, uh, loss of revenue and uh, loss of ice time is uh, does add up throughout a season. One of the good news, though, is that uh, we are looking to uh, schedule Westmeath Arena and have it open uh, later this month. So we are on track for opening up the, the third arena uh, in 2021, and uh, we're hoping to have some holiday skates that will be offered uh, throughout the, the holiday season. I just want to scroll down here just to talk a little bit about the engagement. And... Um, the department actually had met with uh, many of the users prior to the provincial changes and this is something that the department does on a regular basis actually a yearly basis uh, we meet with our users just to talk about the direction that we're going to be going in uh, if they have any concerns as well as their ice times um, so we did talk about um, some of the changes that could be coming down the pipe uh, and most uh, users were preparing themselves for that change and um, as a result uh, you know they were moving forward with uh, different vaccinations and, and protocols and whatnot Something else that we've recently done is uh, we've also engaged with some of our non-resident users who have uh, historically used the ice in Westmeath. Um, so we wanted to basically get an understanding of how much ice is really going to be used uh, in that facility. Um, we really don't have a whole lot of, of uh, interest at this point in time, um, but with engaging with some of the non-resident users, um, we're getting an idea on how much ice we can build in terms of uh, ice rentals for this, for this upcoming season. And finally, something that we want to look at doing uh, in Westmeath is uh, engaging the WDRA and exploring some, some options for offering um, ice programming. So in terms of public skating for the upcoming year, uh, we want to see, we think it would be appropriate to, to engage them as a community partner and um, to try and uh, help get some, some things going in the, the actual arena itself. 
Um, and I'm just going to skip over the financial implications. Just simply, I have brought this forward to Council before in, in other reports. And just finally, as I wrap this up, I just wanted to note that we are coordinating right now uh, plant startup at, in the Westmeath Arena. And like I said, we're hopeful that we're going to have uh, ice in and ready for holiday skates. Um, we're also coordinating staff at this point in time and trying to get a lot of the, the building maintenance done before we do open. And finally, uh, we're in the process of drafting a holiday skate poster and it should be out for distribution uh, shortly. Thank you. Um, any questions? Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, just a couple. I, I, I guess, Jordan, was uh, have we lost any ice time? Uh, and I'm thinking from Pembroke with their silver stick. We used to, I know Westmeath Arena used to be booked pretty solid, and so was Beachburg. Uh, have we lost some ice bookings because we can't fulfill those? So all the uh, silver stick uh, rentals that normally would occur in Westmeath were transferred to Beachburg this year. Okay. Uh, and do you know yet how much, like, I guess one, one problem, we have now got four arena operators and we only have two arenas running at this time. Um, um, I, I'm just wondering, like, how much, uh, and if the uh, minor hockey is that much less, how much ice time or how much time uh, is being booked at the two operating arenas now? Are they fully booked solid? Yeah, so we have ice rentals uh, every single evening and every single uh, day of the weekend at both uh, Beachburg and, and Cobb Arena right now. Full evenings? Uh, full evenings in terms of we have rentals. Um, you know, it could be anywhere from three to five hours of rentals uh, per evening. Okay, I, I was just looking at how, how much utilization, it, it maybe how, how much they're being used uh, as well. That, those were my questions because the first thing came to my mind is, well, Westmeath isn't, and Westmeath used to book the silver stick, but you say now the silver stick is all going to, like any of our ice time that we would have had Westmeath, Beachburg, is all being able to be filled in Beachburg. We're not losing anything there, but obviously there's, there's less utilization of, of the ice if we have more uh, rental time. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Councillor Nicholson. Thanks, Mayor. Jordan, uh, I just, uh, I wonder, I I'm cognizant of the fact that we're gonna get the ice in in, in Westmeath and I appreciate the staff's effort to uh, to pull out all the stops to get that done. Um, and the, the, the partnership with the WDRA sounds like a great initiative to encourage the community use of that facility, especially since we've gone to all the work to get it going. I just wonder if there might be other um, uh, salesmanship opportunities that we may be able to try. Uh, I'm thinking of, of, of hockey school uh, Operators, we know there's a there's a couple schools hockey uh, hockey goalie schools in Pembroke, and we've got a couple hockey school instructors in the community. Maybe if we have huge blocks of ice that are available, it might be something to entice them out to it. Maybe they just don't know about that opportunity in there. Um, I mean, a facility would be perfect for something like that with four dressing rooms and a hall upstairs, and maybe we could create some kind of package. That would uh, that would help facilitate them and, and make use of the ice that you guys have worked so hard to put in. I throw that out there. I appreciate any effort. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Romstead. Yeah, um, two things. One, um, some of the discussion seems to be centered around like long term implications, <laughs> and it, it we're still not even anywhere near back to normal. Um, with respect to COVID and operating and employees, number of employees, that kind of stuff. So it, it's so hard to make decisions right now based on future when we haven't been normal for this is the second season, full second season now, I believe. So um, I, I'd hesitate to make any kind of long-term decisions that have implications. Um, and just a question about the holiday skate. Will we be um, looking for sponsors again this year, Jordan? 
Uh, yeah, if, uh, if any sponsors want to come on board, we are in the process of approaching some of our previous sponsors from, um, uh, we didn't do it last year, but the year before, um, so absolutely. Great. Yeah, I, I know there are a number of um, <coughs> businesses and former ones that were on the list before that are interested, and um, every community that seems to have a Tim Hortons, uh, they're a big sponsor in their communities. I know Renfrew had um, probably about 10 different ice times sponsored by Tim Hortons, so as we now have a, a new facility in town, that might be a, a, a go-get too. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Didn't know that. Councillor Mackay. Uh, I was in the uh, rink uh, two weeks ago with my grandson. He lives in Pem Pembroke and they played in uh, Beechburg. And I was looking how well the new Zamboni, or Olympic I guess it is, with the uh, uh, GPS on it. And the guy was telling me it just works perfect and uh, that's great. Thank you. I haven't seen it yet. I'll have to get in and have a peek at it. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, call for a vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.9, Parks and Rec. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region receive this report for information purposes as it pertains to the status update on the recommendations of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan and Operational Review. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Mackay and Reeve Regeer, thank you. This goes back to Jordan. All right, thanks again. Um, so again, this is another uh, information report that uh, we felt we wanted to bring forward to Council uh, and share with everyone here, uh, and especially too that uh, some councillors have asked for an update. Um, so just a bit of background on this one. So um, everyone here is aware that we, uh, we took over the arenas in 2017, and that included Beechburg, uh, Cobden, and Westmeath. And uh, we also assumed the responsibilities for grass cutting and park maintenance in uh, 2019. So during that time, in between 2017 and 18, uh, there was a, uh, a recreation master plan that was um, uh, in the works and it was adopted by council in uh, May of 2019. Um, the township also had received some provincial funding that, that enabled us to also complete an operational review for parks and recreation. And the report was uh, brought to council this, this past May. Um, something that I, I wanted to, to note here is um, in the report you're going to see that there's recommendations and as well as the status update and uh, you'll notice here with the recreation master plan uh, we've been able to either implement the majority of, of these uh, and or uh, get them underway at least uh, have a discussion. Um, some of the outstanding items, what, we're, what we've done is we've put a projected uh, timeline on it um, just so that we can um, force ourselves into having those discussions, getting things done, and then we can also bring back to Council um, with a report on the completion of this. I just want to uh, also note too, just on engagement, um, something that we, um, we did this year is we, of course, uh, started with the Recreation Task Force in Westmeath. And uh, this essentially was something that we wanted to do to provide feedback uh, from input uh, from our stakeholders uh, for the, the people that are living in Westmeath and La Paz area. And this is something that has actually transpired into something really good. And uh, we're hoping to mimic this in uh, different areas of the, the township uh, of Whitewater Region um, in the coming year or years. And it's something that we would like to do with, with uh, other folks as well. So I think uh, at this point in time, maybe what I'll do is I'll turn it back to the chair. If there's any questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Jackson. I see in number 33, the Little Lakes. Um, the recommendation is to explore that Little Lakes be promoted as, as an engine-free lake. But then number two, it says explore that Little Lakes be stocked with fish. Kind of contradicts uh, the fact that it should be an engine-free lake. I would like to see it an engine-free lake, but whether or not, and I don't know how many fish are actually in Little Lakes, but I do see some uh, fishing there. Uh, I think if we, um, if we were to stock it, then I think there should be a limit on the, the size of motor that is at Little Lakes. I know last summer there was a, a larger boat that was uh, spinning around in there that I received some complaints about. Um, so I, I'd like to see that you know, either that engine uh, size be reduced or that we don't uh, stock the fish. Like it, it, you're encouraging fishermen to go out, then you don't want them to have a motorized boat. It doesn't make sense. Okay, Jordan. Uh, yeah, just to, to make a comment on that. So um, with this, um, 
that was something that just came out of the recreation master plan, of course, from somebody in the community. And what we've done to, to kind of uh, control at this point in time is if you'll notice down at Little Lakes, when we, when we put in all the, uh, the amenities, we ran a, a long fencing. And that was kind of uh, the purpose of that was uh, like for decor, but it was also to... Um, um, to alleviate some of the like larger boats. So if, if there was a fishing boat that was to go in, it would have a smaller engine. You're not going to get something in there that has a, a great big engine, right? Because they can't physically get their boat into the water. Um, we did explore this very, very minimally, but it's uh, to, in order to uh, remove engines from that lake entirely, it would be a, a pretty big process with the ministry. So it's something we still have to look into. And I mean, if we keep it minimal, like a 9.9 and or less, um, you know, I think that's fair at this point in time, and that was part of the reasoning for the fencing. Was that fencing in place this summer? Uh, no, it came with the uh, infrastructure program uh, in 2018 or 19. So it was in place this summer, and yet there was a larger boat that did access the lake. Oh, did I? Okay. Yes. Um, well, we'll have to look into it, I guess, right? So, okay. yeah. Thank yeah, well, so the purpose of that was, was to, now, if, they, if they're able to back in, you know what I mean, get their boat in, uh, I guess good for them. But um, at the same time, it's something I guess then we'd have to explore, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay. Anybody's ever been on that lake with a canoe or something, like very, very minimum use of motor because you get into that sandbar area at the one end. I don't know why you even want to have a maybe small boat motor, but there's no place to go is what I'm saying. Yeah, I've only known small motors to be on there. I don't know how that other person did with the larger motor, but maybe he'll never come back. <laughs> well, I think it was like a sea do boat. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And of course, sea dews can get in there too, and they're, and they're fast, Yeah. as we all know, and they can create large wakes as well. I think it maybe should be a wake-free lake if we can implement that. Yeah, I don't know. Certain, certainly something for Jordan to make a note of. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rumstead. Uh, um, Quebec actually has a number of lakes and a lot of really large lakes like Muskrat Lake where it's trolling motor only, electric motors only. And um, so there's very little wake, if any wake at all. They won't, they'll only pull you around a little bit. Um, and I was on a number of them fishing and it, it's fantastic. There's, you don't hear the boat. There's no sound whatsoever. You're out in the middle of the lake. Uh, and there's all kinds of boats out there, but you would know you wouldn't know there's a boat out there at all because of the the minimal uh, force that you know you're going maybe whatever two or three kilometers an hour is all you're doing. And I don't know how um, they enforce it, but I do know when we went to the lakes that, that there was signage up uh, trolling motors, electric trolling motors only. Period. So I don't know Jordan what you'd have to do to look into something like that, but I don't know if the ministry would need to be consulted for something like that. Yeah, they'd have to be consulted for sure. And I actually, to be honest with you, I don't even know um, if we could even uh, control that, like it, because it wouldn't be our body of water. So it would be something that they'd have to give us direction on. And okay, thank you. I only have one comment, and it has to do with the stocking. Um, surely we'd be going on ministry recommendations before any stocking was done, because uh, over the years, I know they've been stocking and they keep track of what's what's in there, etc. So. Um, that was how, how we should proceed. Okay, anything else? Seeing nothing, call for a vote. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Now we'll go on to item seven, notice of motion. Any notice of motion? Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Councillor Jackson. And maybe it's just a question, and I don't know if the procedural bylaw should be taken a look at, um, when that can be done before um, the next Council, like, is there any time limits, restrictions, or if that can be looked at? I think there's a number of items, and I, I think definitely delegations should be taken a look at. Thank you. Okay, so the somebody has that. Oh, he's writing. The CAO is writing down your. Okay, Carmen's got it too. Okay. Awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McLaughlin. I don't know if this is the right time, right place, or if you're going to have a deputy mayor, uh, then are we going to set comp extra compensation? Because there used to be, I know that. And at what point do we have to do that, or can we do it? And I really think that that should be done before the election. 
I'm, I'm not, I guess maybe I should have brought that up in the discussion and, and then never thought of it at that point. And so my uh, question would point towards the CAO then, at what point would this come up? Would it be after the, the bylaw is, is approved and then, then go to the next meeting or? I think uh, just to Councillor McLaughlin, raising it here, but instead of the Councillor having to do a notice of motion, Carmen and I will, and the Treasurer will work on, you're to do, you, you, you're, you should look at it at least once per term. We did a very, very late in the last one, early of this one. So I was planning to do a report with Carmen and Sean to bring forward probably on December 15th on the process to move forward. So it'll, to your point, the bylaw will be in place, but we'll look at it very soon. And it would take effect for the next term of council. So you, you wouldn't be changing your remuneration. You'd be looking at the next term. So we'll do a report for December 15th on that to council. Oh, say so. Point. So Councilor McLaughlin's notice of motion then doesn't need to stand? It's good. We can or note it. Or do we it, need it to stand? And I, we'll just note that the CAO, that we, staff are bringing forward a report anyway. Okay. You happy with that, Councilor McLaughlin? Well, also, uh, I'm, I'm wondering about compensation to to meetings there's so many more meetings that we're having uh now that we're doing our own uh official plan do we need to look at that or do we leave it the way it is um, i don't know whether that comes up or it doesn't yep. but yep. if we're if we're going to do these things i think it should be done at least looked at before the next council would be sworn in It'll look at all options of council remuneration and compare who has per diems versus who doesn't. So it'll it'll be it'll be a fulsome review. Okay. No. And, and if he's going to do a fulsome review, I'm fine with that. I'm just wondering, uh, and a follow up. I know Rob told me we were going to get a report on the flags, December. the flag poles. Uh, December fifteenth, and then okay. Councillor um, uh, Nicholson's reuse. Notice the motion, the staff report's coming as well on December 15th. So those okay. two are coming. Okay. N and I'll stop. Okay. Uh, nothing Thank you. more. Seeing nothing else, we'll move on to <coughs> regular minutes of council. And special. Pardon? And special. Yes. Uh, 8.1, recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the regular minutes of November, November 3 and the special council minutes of November 24. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Mackay and Councillor Jackson, all in favour? Carried, thank you. Correspondence, seeing none. Bylaws number 10, 10.1, recommendation be it resolved that the bylaw 21-12-1452, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council, been taken as read and passed. Motion and a seconder. Councilor McLaughlin and Reeve Rigier, all in favor? Carried, thank you. 11.1, closed session. CAO's performance appraisal, recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region, move into closed session at 7.04 p.m. as permitted under section nine of the procedural bylaw with the CAO slash deputy clerk participating in the meeting to discuss a human resources matter pertaining to personal mat personnel matters about in identifiable individuals, including municipal or local board employees or, and labor relations slash employee negotiations. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Rumstead and Councillor Jackson. We are in close now, thank you.